Hello, and welcome back to the Shaky Sonnet Show. I am Too Tight Latrek, the drag laureate of the sanitarium. And here we are once again in the sanitarium at the bottom of the down staircase in the permanently sequestered remainder section of an unnamed local library, which may or may not have two lions couchant on the front steps, ready and waiting for a complete change of pace. Perhaps they've been listening in on that strange creature in the sub-basement, Sovereign Mistress over Rack, which is my new nom de plume, and they are sensing that we are now turning to what are known as the Dark Lady Sonnets, or Sonnets 127 to 154 in Shakespeare's 1609 quarto of his sonnets. Now, will we let the fact that nowhere in these sonnets is she ever referred to as a dark lady deter us? Of course we will not. Nor will we let the fact that there is often no gender specified at all deter us as well. It has not stopped certain scholars, however, because while not terribly accurate or maybe terribly inaccurate, um, the terms like the young man sonnets or the dark lady sonnets are convenient. Not accurate, but convenient. And so that can become a bit of a problem. Another problem, in fact, comes in terms of chronology. Sonnets 127 through 154 likely contain the earliest sonnets that Shakespeare wrote. And we know this for two reasons. One, because two of the sonnets, sonnets 138 and 144, appeared 11 years prior in The Passionate Pilgrim, which was published in 1598. And secondly, because there are no late, rare words in sonnets 127 through 154. But, too tight Lautrec, drag laureate of the sanitarium and sovereign mistress over wreck, you might ask, what are late rare words? Well, I wondered the same thing. There is a fascinating study that appeared in the winter 1991 edition of Studies in Philology by Hyatt, 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 and Prescott that examined the occurrence of words appearing in Shakespeare's play written before 1600 and those appearing in Shakespeare's plays written after 1600, and they compared them with words that occur in the sonnets. And I will link the article below. It's a JSTOR article, which, I, and this is when I learned that you can access many, many scholarly articles just by signing up to JSTOR. It's free, and you can get up to 100 articles for free each month. So I recommend it. And you don't really even have to give any of your information away, except maybe your email address or something like that. But anyway, I will link it below. So in that study, they noted that words like audit, outgo, foison, eclipse, and nerve all appear in sonnets 1 through 126 and in Shakespeare plays written after 1600. And none of those words appear in sonnets 127 through 154, which is why they believe that those were written before the rest of the sonnets. So it's a very detailed, they go into their methodology and, and all of their suppositions and conclusions. And if you're interested in it, you can follow the link below. But regardless of when these particular sonnets, 127 through 154, may have been composed or revised, someone put them in order in the 154 sonnet series and numbered them 127 through 154. Now, the, the poet Dante Gabriel Rossetti had a very perspicacious view of these sonnets, and he said that really sonnets 1 through 125 should be called part 1. Sonnet 126 should be called epilogue to part 1. Sonnets 127 through 152 should be called part 2, and sonnets 153 and 154 should be called epilogue to part 2. I concur. So we'll keep Rossetti's general framework in mind, keeping an open mind and departing from it 
when necessary or, you know, when I have a, a, any special whim that allows me to depart from it. So part two of the sonnets is what we'll call it. There are a few more issues, one of which is that not everyone likes them. William Will Wordsworth, in fact, hated them. And according to Hyder Edward Rollins, Wordsworth scribbled in a copy of Robert Anderson's Works of the British Poets, which was published in 1795, these words next to the sonnets. These sonnets, this is Wordsworth, these sonnets beginning at 127 to his mistress are worse than a puzzle peg. They are abominably harsh, obscure, and worthless. The others are, for the most part, much better, have many fine lines, very fine lines and passages. They are also, in many places, warm with passion. Their chief faults, and heavy ones they are, are sameness, tediousness, quaintness, and elaborate obscurity. We shall see if we concur or vehemently disagree with William Wordsworth. So if 127 and beyond are to or about his mistress, the narrator's mistress, as Wordsworth contends, and if she is dark, hence the dark lady appellation, then just who might this dark lady or dark mistress be, either fictionally or biographically? I have a list for you. She, it has been proposed, is a woman of African descent, or Indian descent, or Asian descent, or English, Irish, or Mediterranean descent, or Queen Elizabeth I, or Mrs. Shakespeare, a.k.a. Anne Hathaway, or a prostitute, ethnicity undetermined, or rather ever-changing, depending on which critic you read. And the list goes on. Why do we have all these questions? Well, what do the sonnets tell us about her physically? She has raven eyes, number one. Her breasts are done, which is sort of a, a brownish, beigeish, palish, grayish color that's not really very specific. And she has black wires for hairs. And, and that's about it as far as her physical characteristics go. Now, one might ask, well, is this the only dark lady in Shakespeare, in all of Shakespeare? Were there other dark ladies in his other work? Turns out there were. Anne Page in Merry Wives of Windsor, Rosaline in Love's Labor's Lost, Hero in Much Ado About Nothing, Phoebe in As You Like It, and Cleopatra in, drumroll please, Antony and Cleopatra. So, dark ladies in Shakespeare. Not all that unusual. Okay, so then there is this question or the, the concept of darkness and lightness in Shakespeare and in Western literature. So things that are dark without illumination, things that are light with illumination. Dark, we associate with nighttime. Light with daytime. Dark with secrecy. Light with openness. Dark with ill deeds done under the cover of darkness. Light, sunlight is the best disinfectant. With darkness we tend to associate sex and with lightness, chastity. In general, darkness in Shakespeare and in Western literature is sometimes perceived as a negative and lightness is conceived as a positive. Not always, but often. So because the lady is deemed by many critics as the dark lady, there are, of course, racial implications. But we can't be 100% sure what those racial implications might be any more than we can know what the implications of close or very close male-male relationships might be in, Elizabeth, in Elizabethan England which is another beauty of the sonnets, because there are all these possibilities ripe for exploration and contemplation. 
So what I have been able to surmise, and we all know I'm a huge surmise queen, what I've been able to surmise is that as it stands, it appears that in this sonnet series, there is one narrator. That narrator appears to be male. And it seems he has taken a fancy to a young man and now to a swarthy woman. That's all I can surmise at the moment. But sovereign mistress over rack, you might ask. Why is that siren blaring in the distance? Well, they've got their own issues. Don't know what they might be. We'll let it pass. But sovereign mistress over rack, you might ask. In Western literature, wasn't being fair in appearance considered beautiful, but being described as dark was considered not beautiful? Well, thank you for asking. Yes. In general, that's true, but, and it's a big but, fashions change. By 1609, dark-haired and dark-eyed women were lauded as beautiful much more frequently in literature. So much so that in Samuel Daniel's sonnet sequence Delia, the beloved Delia has golden hair in the original published in 1592, but when Daniel revised it and republished it in 1601, he changed her hair to sable. So keep that in mind with all these observations swirling about in our brains. Let's delve into part two of William Shakespeare's 1609 quarto of the sonnets, beginning with sonnet 127. In the old age, Black was not counted fair, or, if it were, it bore not beauty's name. But now is black beauty's successive heir, and beauty slandered with a bastard shame. For since each hand hath put on nature's power, faring the foul with art's false borrowed face, sweet beauty hath no name, no holy bower, but is profaned, if not lives in disgrace. Therefore, my mistress' eyes are raven black. Her eyes, so suited, and they mourners seem, at such who, not born fair, no beauty lack, slandering creation with a false esteem. Yet so they mourn, becoming of their woe, that every tongue says beauty should look so. Okay. So, right off the bat, in the old age, what is that? A thousand years ago? A hundred years ago? Last year? In, in the old days when I used to fancy young men instead of women? In fact, maybe only one sonnet ago? It's not specified what the old age might be. But in my, in my old life, it seems to be saying, black was not counted fair. And fair could be blonde and blue-eyed, it could mean beautiful, or it could mean of good moral character. So in the old age, black was not counted fair, or if it were, it bore not beauty's name. So here we have a definitive statement. Black was not counted fair, followed by a subversion of that statement, if it were, or if it were, all of which is in passive voice with no speaker identified. And then as we go along, we see that there are a lot of no's and nots that seem to be defining whatever is beautiful or is not beautiful by negation, similar to a method that we saw in sonnet 116. So, in the old age, black was not common affair, or if it were, it bore not beauty's name. But now, is beauty's, is black beauty's successive heir, successive heir meaning true inheritor and beauty slandered with a bastard shame. So beauty is slandered with a bastard shame. Beauty here seems to be the old beauty, the fair beauty, and may I add the male beauty. And let's think all the way back to three sonnets ago, to sonnet 124, which was that gorgeous 
you and me against the world sonnet declaring the love that the narrator shares with the young man and saying that our love nobody understands our love and it can be considered as for fortune's unfathered bastard by the world at large well guess who's entered the world at large now the narrator seems to have put his old life away and entered a new phase so now he's ashamed so he's now with his new love his dark love his female love which we'll get to in a moment and he's ashamed of the bastard love that he held for the beloved in sonnet 124 if we're reading this as a continuous narrative and we are if we were to read this as a single sonnet in isolation it seems to be just a declaration of changing fashions of beauty it used to be black wasn't considered fair um, used to be you know they would call it all sorts of names but now beauty seems to be in vogue so the cover of renaissance vogue seems to be changing from ryan gosling to a picture of zendaya on the cover then we get to the second quatrain which is but what is beauty anyway for since each hand hath put on nature's power faring the foul with art's false borrowed face all these people walking around putting on half a pound of makeup glitter and nails and wigs and who knows what i don't even understand it all these people don't know what beauty is if they were beautiful they wouldn't have to to trick themselves up with all these feathers and boas and and ribbons and and false eyelashes etc etc and i ha i do love that fairing the foul with art's false borrowed face all those f's make it sound really kind of dirty so what is beauty anyway who can tell nowadays with all these stupid beauty gurus and with all these fake beauties sweet beauty hath no name no holy bower but is profaned if not lives in disgrace i mean all these fake beauties real beauty has no name now and is a bastard real beauty has no holy bower or no bedroom in which to consummate a, a love a love in holy matrimony that's sanctioned by society and everyone around them beauty real beauty is profaned pretty strong words real beauty lives in disgrace and here's where i again begin to wonder if our narrator, narrator is really talking about his new beloved or if he's actually almost waxing nostalgic for his late lately let go fair beloved the fair beauty of before because provaned and disgraced i mean i'm not saying i'd go back to ryan gosling but dang those were some those are some pretty nice days and some pretty hot nights is all i'm saying so then we get to the third quatrain therefore my hello mistress that's right therefore my mistress's eyes are raven black her brows so suited well in in kerrigan he has brows there's a problem with line 10 where a lot of editors believe that because in the 1609 quarto eyes is repeated therefore my mistress's eyes are raven black her eyes so suited and they mourners seem a lot of editors don't like the fact that the eyes was repeated and they replace it with brows and among those editors are kerrigan here edmondson and wells and burroughs tend to use brows those that use eyes or retain the 1609 quarto version of eyes are berto that's the signet classics uh, editor blake moore evans Stephen Booth and Don Patterson and Two Tight Lautrec. So the eyes have it. Her eyes, because it makes absolute sense with eyes. Her eyes are mourners. Therefore, my mistress's eyes are raven black. Her brows, her eyes so suited. So her eyes are suited and those eyes seem to be mourners. Her eyes mourn all the ugly uggos who are trying so hard and failing with all their 
makeup and glitter to look as beautiful as she does. Because she, because they were not born fair. Um, and, they, and they slander creation with their false stuff. Then we get to the couplet. Yet so they mourn, her, the eyes, the raven black eyes mourn, becoming of their woe. They are, they're beautiful in their woe as they're mourning the poor ugly uggos circling around trying to look beautiful. That every tongue says beauty should look so. So now beauty is black. My mistress's eyes are black and this is what beauty should look like. This is, I think, quite a nice, quite a nice uh, turn in that couplet. And I just wanted to say, because, well, it really wouldn't be a season if we didn't start out with the cocktail party vocabulary word. Don Patterson's defense of keeping the word eyes in line 10, we'll put this to the side, is thus. He says, if you read line 10 with a D emphasis on eyes and an expressive rise on suited, the repetition now just reads as a rhetorically effective diacope which of course it does, a diacope. We'll, we'll drink to that. Mm. A diacope is a literary technique that involves the intentional repetition of words, such as to be or not to be, or her eyes are raven black, her eyes so suited. So diacope. Happy cocktail party vocabulary word. So now we have to ask, well, I think we've already asked. My mistress, line 10. No, I'm sorry, line 9. We have a gender. He's, he's now lauding the praises of a woman and it seems like a whole new world. Dramatically, where might... 127 fit into Shakespeare's work. Well, Edmondson and Wells, Wells note similarities to Byron and on Rosaline's features, as I said, in Love, Slaver's Lost, and Sylvius on Phoebe's features in As You Like It. So there are instances of dark ladies that abound in Shakespeare. It's not a surprise. It's not a, not a something absolutely new. Narratively, where do we stand if we're taking this as a continuous series? The narrator seems to be saying, I like fair young men and swarthy women. Is that so wrong? I don't think so. Do we have a vivid picture of the new beloved in Sonnet 127? She's a woman. Check. She has dark eyes. Check. She's beautiful. Check. All of which is about as specific as the physical characteristics that we were able to obtain from the first 126 sonnets of the young man. We don't have that much to go on in terms of the physicality of this person who seems to be the subject of the lover's observations in Sonnet 127. What do we make of this? It's a whole new world for this particular narrator. All we can do is keep our fingers crossed and hope that all works out for this narrator and his new beloved. It could happen because, as we know, the world is full of wonder. I'll be paying attention, and I hope you will be as well. Until we meet again, I am Too Tight Trek. Mm -hmm.